Welcome. I'm Joan Barrett. I'm the President and General Manager at um, WCNC Charlotte. Thanks for joining us. I'm sure we've seen some of you before, but if any of you are new, welcome. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Lauren Beckerly, who is um, helping facilitate all the Zoom and invite information um, through uh, Tegna Media Services. So thank you, Lauren. And then we also have Stephanie Mackey, who some of you have met, um, our brand manager at WCNC. She's facilitating um, the sessions for us. And then we have two of our esteemed trainers here today from our team. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves and begin the program. Today, our focus is weather, meteorology, and sports uh, reporting and anchoring and journalism. So we're going to focus on those two content areas today. And I think you'll learn a lot. And I'm going to throw it to Ashley to begin the introductions. Thanks, Ashley. Right. Thanks, Joan. Well, hey, everybody. I'm super happy to be a part of this. Um, I was a former teacher, so I feel like I'm getting to like tap into those skills that I haven't used in a while. And um, it's kind of unique how this all came together because I actually went to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting or CSB Media Arts School now. And um, yeah, I was teaching high school, decided I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I always had an interest in sports. I played sports growing up. So I was like, how can I kind of parlay that into a career and still be involved in the community and uh, ended up going down this path, which my mom told me I should have done in the beginning, but who listens to mom the first time around? So, uh, but it all worked out and um, I'm just super happy to be a part of the WCNC Charlotte team and, and happy to be with you guys today. So yeah, I think it's, my story is kind of cool that you guys are all here. If you've attended all the sessions, you'll get uh, you know, a little scholarship money to attend the same school I went to. It was perfect for me because everyone that taught the classes worked in the business from radio to doing social media to TV broadcasting. And from that, I was able to get really good internships. And from that point, I just hung around and was like, you guys have to find a job for me. And I started out as an editor and worked my way up to part-time sports and full-time sports. And now I'm, I'm here at NBC and super happy. So I'm gonna send it over to Aisha. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Aisha Scott. Um, I am a meteorologist here at WCNC Charlotte. Um, so I'm one of those people, I have been obsessed with weather ever since I was seven years old. So I grew up loving hurricanes and thunderstorms. And most kids run away from those things, but I was attracted to it. And I said, you know what, I think this is what I want to do. So I was seven years old, I stuck with it. And you know, to this day, I still enjoy what I do, and especially encouraging, especially students um, to think about what they're passionate about. Um, I've been here for three years. I started my career in Wilmington, North Carolina, went to Norfolk, Virginia, and then came here to Charlotte, North Carolina. So I am super excited to be uh, at WCNC Charlotte. And I think we're gonna have a good time today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our careers. We've got some fun videos to show, and certainly we'll get to um, questions at the end. So let's go ahead and start. Okay, so we'll start with meteorology and education. So if you are thinking about becoming a meteorologist, you will need to have a degree in meteorology or a related field. So that related field could be uh, geosciences, it could be atmospheric science. Now there are many meteorologists especially within the TV business uh, who have journalism or communications degrees. I'm one of them. So I actually went to Norfolk State University and got my bachelor's degree in mass communications. And then I went to Mississippi State and got another bachelor's degree in meteorology. You don't have to get two bachelor degrees, but you know, just keep in mind if you do, maybe you're starting to think about a journalism degree, or maybe you already have a journalism degree, but you want to get into meteorology, you will just need to supplement uh, your communications education. So you can supplement it by either going back to school and getting, say, a bachelor's degree. I know uh, colleagues of mine who have gotten a master's degree in meteorology if they only had the journalism uh, bachelor's degree, but also you can get a certificate in meteorology, which is typically a three-year program. All right, so I, I wanted to show this slide and I, I want to show it to be transparent, <laughs> but I don't want to scare you away at the same time. So just keep in mind that if you want to get a degree in meteorology, you want to become a meteorologist, there are some really tough classes that you're going to have to take. Some of those classes include physics, thermodynamics, 
weather forecasting, which is actually one of my favorite classes to take, radar and satellite meteorology. And then once you're done with the sciences, we got to get to the math. So we're talking calculus one, two, and three, differential equations that actually goes beyond calculus three. I had to take all of those classes. And honestly, I took calculus one three times and passed it the third time. Um, and it had me questioning if this was really what I wanted to do. But if it is something that you're really passionate about pursuing, definitely, definitely take these classes But it, because it will help you later on down the line to get some of the seals and the other requirements that you need to become, say, certified, um, if you will, as a meteorologist. Okay, so experience. Internships are a must. I know we're in COVID right now, but things are starting to get a little bit better, right? So internships will be coming back around as they were pre-COVID. Um, what you can also do is reach out to your local meteorologist to see if there are shadowing opportunities and you can actually shadow on Zoom. So you can shadow virtually. Um, when I did my, the way I kind of got started was I shadowed um, some of the meteorologists in my hometown, I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. I shadowed some of the local meteorologists and then I ended up from that shadowing opportunity, I got an internship. And so I would go intern um, and then I actually was hired on as production. So I actually worked from four to seven in the morning and then had an eight o'clock class in college. And I was like, what am I doing? But it all paid off, so it's okay. Um, during those internships and those shadowing opportunities, you're going to learn so, so much. And this is why I say internships, shadowing is, is key. So you're going to learn how to forecast the weather. It is not as easy as it sounds. It's not as easy as it looks. Uh, how to use a graphic system. So we use what's called WSI. Um, you'll learn the chroma key or the green screen. I feel like a lot of people are always so intrigued by the green screen. And you'll be able to make a resume tape. So the resume tape is what you're going to use to get your first job when you start looking for your first TV gig. Um, and my resume tape, keep in mind, I would, I would show you all, but you don't want to see how bad I was when I first started. So we'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about some shifts. Um, with meteorology, these are the typical shifts. So we have weekday morning meteorologists, we have evening meteorologists, weekend morning meteorologists, weekend evening meteorologists, and some stations actually have a noon and 4 p.m. Uh, meteorologist. And typically the evening meteorologist holds the chief meteorologist position, but I have worked at stations where the chief meteorologist was actually the morning meteorologist too. Morning in progress. All right, so we've got a video here that I wanna show you um, so, so that you get a better idea of what happens behind the scenes. I mentioned we use a graphic system and I mentioned the green screen. So I'm gonna show you how those work here. All right, this is our weather graphic system. And you can almost think of this as a PowerPoint presentation because in PowerPoint, you make slides and you give a presentation or you tell a story. And with us, it's kind of the same thought process. So with us, we make graphics. So these graphics could really be anything. These are dew points. Uh, the dew points actually talk about the amount of moisture in the air, uh, the overnight lows, so the lows tonight, or they could be high temperatures. You know, whatever the case, you create these graphics and you put them in a particular order. So this order will determine your weather story. So maybe you wanna talk about the fact that, you know, it is quiet out there right now. We've got, you know, a clear sky, but you know, you wanna show why we have a clear sky with high pressure and control. And maybe if we have any changes coming, like that cold front that will be dropping into the region. So you place these slides, in an, or in our case, graphics, in a particular order, and that will help you tell the weather story. Now, I wanna take you over to the green screen, and yes, all of this is in our studio. Here's the green screen, and I feel like the green screen is where the magic happens. And yes, I'm standing in front of the green screen, but what you see at home is not a green screen. You actually see our weather maps, and these maps allow us to tell a weather story. So right now behind me, we have current satellite and radar, but really these maps could be anything. They could be the low temperatures tonight, 
They could be the seven day forecast, a radar tracking rain and storms. Again, these weather maps could be anything. It all just depends on the weather story. So you may be wondering then what I see. What I see when I turn to my left, it's just a green screen. So then how do I know what I'm pointing to, what I'm pointing at, what I'm looking at? I actually have some monitors on my left here, and these monitors show me exactly what you're seeing at home on your TV screen. So hopefully that gave you some insight into the green screen. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, so I will send it over to my colleague, Ashley Strohline, and she's going to talk about sports reporting and anchoring. Well, Aisha, it's kind of funny seeing all the <laughs> classes that you had to take because my first degree is in math. So I'm questioning, should I have do, you know, should I have went the sports route or should I have went into being a meteorologist? So maybe I need to go back and, and rethink that. But um, could have done uh, that. <laughs> yeah, how funny. I was like, wait, Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3. I had to go all the way through Calc 4, but, you know, we'll save that for another day. We can talk about it on the weekends, but I am so grateful to be where I'm at in life as a, a sports anchor and reporter. Um, I really feel like you don't always get it right the first time around, so I went back to school twice to get to where I'm at today, but I grew up in a really small little town where I feel like you can dream big dreams, and then you have to actually get out into the real world and, and see what's out there and, and make it happen, so um, for me, I kind of, when I moved to Charlotte and I realized I didn't want to teach math for the next 30 years, um, I kind of knocked on every door at every TV and radio station in town and a few people were nice enough to have conversations with me. But the one thing they all told me was to get in the door, you need to go back to school, you need to get the internship. And that's what led me to uh, CSB. And that was an eight month program. I was teaching high school, I was doing night classes and I was interning on the weekends. And then after that, I was still teaching high school and the station that I interned at hired me as a part-time editor. So I would teach math during the day, drive into the city, run prompter and edit the 8 p.m. newscast. And I did that from February until May. And I was like, okay, if I'm really going to chase the dream, I've got to let teaching go. We'll let the, you know, solid paycheck and health benefits go. We're going to chase the dream and work two part-time jobs. So I worked for KISS 95.1, Manny Roy and Loren as their morning show producer part-time, I would nap in between my two jobs and of the evening I would go edit. And eventually just a lot of hard work um, led to me getting to move to the sports department. And then from that got a full-time job and now I'm where I'm at now. And, and again, super grateful. So with all of that being said, that's the short version of my story. It's a little- um, Please mute yourselves if you're not muted. It's a little different than I think most most people's way to being a sports reporter and anchor. But just to give you background, I kind of feel like, you know, my story kind of shows that you can do anything. So to maybe relate to you guys, I've tried to be cool and make a TikTok and we're going to play that. And these are kind of like some of my everyday tasks when I'm here at work. What it's like to be a sports and and reporter. You'll edit video, produce and write your own show, be responsible for social media and digital stories. You'll also do your own hair and makeup and choose your own outfit for the show. When in studio anchoring, you may also run teleprompter. And when in the field, you will most likely set up your own gear and run your live shot, but sometimes work with a photographer. All right, so I always get a lot of questions. I think there's a little bit of a, a misconception on like what it's actually like working in TV. So sometimes I'll have people come shadow and they're like, wait, you do your own hair and makeup? Wait, you picked out your outfit? Wait, you're carrying a tripod and a camera? You're shooting the video that you use? So that was my quick little 30 second clip on what it's like uh, you know, in my role, and it changes day to day. If I'm anchoring in the studio, I'm gonna produce the sports cast, I'm gonna write the scripts, I'm gonna edit the video work really hard to keep up with our digital stuff and post stories, get myself as TV ready as possible. And then if I'm in the field, I could be shooting my own video, my own highlights, getting the interviews, uh, and then setting all that up and running my live shot. On a really good day, I get to work with one of our awesome photographers. And um, we also run our own teleprompter in studio, which was something I had to get used to when I started working here. So I feel like it's a lot more than, than what you might think. And then we'll move on to the next slide now. Yeah, so for me, obviously, 
Uh, education wise, it's a little bit different. My bachelor's degree is in math. I was just really good at math. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I just went with that, got a, uh, did a concentration in teaching. And then I went back to, to school and did the program that I mentioned. I was doing night classes at uh, CSB and it just all worked out. That was a great program because for me, I'm a visual learner. I'm a hands-on learner. So they had the studio there that we could do mock sports cast in, or they had, we were able to do a podcast with our group and that kind of thing. So it just really gave me the, the insight that I needed, the visual stuff, the hands-on stuff. We had gear we could check out and, and go out into the field and do our own packages and that kind of thing. So I have here, you know, a bachelor's program in journalism, broadcast journalism, communications or a related field like sports journalism or study at a media art school, like what I did, or uh, sometimes there's some vocational programs. All right, for me, internships, like they're, they're so crucial. Um, that's kind of what helped me get in. My first internship was doing morning radio. I had to be there at like 4.30 in the morning and I would stay through the morning show. I uh, did that throughout the summer. And then I was lucky enough to from go from radio to TV and I got to intern in a sports department and just knew like that's where I'm supposed to be. Um, but they give you a true look at what you're actually gonna be doing. That's where I kind of learned, hey, I'm gonna be carrying a tripod. I'm gonna be shooting everything. I'm gonna have to know how to edit. I'm gonna run prompter. Um, but it also allows you to make the connections that you need. And to me, this is such a connection driven industry. Um, so just really important to constantly reach out and talk to people and and just make those relationships. Uh, the next thing I have here is take advantage of every opportunity and learn multiple job positions. So my first job was an editor, but I also had to run prompter. It's harder than you think when you're running it for other people. Um, but you know, learn how to do everything because you don't know what your first job in the industry will, will be. It could be shooting video, it could be editing, you could be you know, on the digital side of things, writing web stories. Um, but I do all those things with my job right now. So every skill that I've learned along the way, even in my part-time jobs, help prepare me for my full-time job now. Um, and again, here I have, you know, you could start in sports broadcasting or broadcasting in general in, in several ways. It could range from running teleprompter to editing, everything I just said. So you have to be open-minded. I think too many people go through the program and they think, okay, here I am put the camera on me and let's go. But it's it's about so much more than that. So be open-minded and, and learn as much as you can about everyone's role because it's really the people behind the scenes that make the magic happen. All right, potential jobs in sports. I feel like there's so many opportunities. There's what I do. I'm the weekend sports anchor and I report and fill an anchor during the week. You could be a sports producer, a sports photographer, a sports director, weekday sports anchor just a uh, sports reporter, digital sports reporter, but there's also things like team reporters. Uh, there's regional networks that focus on just specific areas like Fox Sports South that maybe focus on like the Hawks, Braves, uh, their MLS team and those types of things. And then there's national sports networks and there's jobs, everything from being like a you know production assistant to a producer to on-air talent. So a lot of different jobs um, I think digital is really taking off because that's just, that's what everybody's focus is right now. Oh, and then I have, okay, here's a little clip of just some stuff I've done just to give you an example of, of different places I've been, different things I've reported on, and we can talk about it after the clip. Well, the Carolina Panthers head to New Orleans with a 5-5 five and five record, and they've lost three of their last four games. And they know that if they want their season to continue into the postseason, every game from here on out is a must win. Coach, you're coming to today's game, controlling your own destiny. With a win, you're here again next week playing for the Conference USA Championship. What was your message pregame? You know, finish this thing off. You know, we started 0-2, and now we've won whatever, eight of our last nine. Well, the NASCAR Cup Series was at Dover International Speedway on Sunday afternoon, where Team Hendrick found a way to dominate the 400 lap race. Okay, so I would love to know about the conversations that those two were having on the golf course today. A lot of stories, a lot of memories made. And right now I'm, I'm out here and I'm having a lot of people walk 
by a lot of excitement going on, and I just made two friends, and they're super excited to be out here. This is Ivy and Ella. They wanted to wave at the camera. They're excited to be out here for the golf tournament this week, and also have some other friends back here checking out what we're doing. Mike Hansen running the camera. So, uh, so many happy faces that we're out here at Quail Hollow Club that the Wells Fargo Championship has returned. It's going to be a great week. Of course, round one starts tomorrow, and we're not done with our coverage. Nick Carboni is going to have more coming up at 5:50. Um, it's new for everyone here at Buzz City, but what's going to happen before the game? There'll be a tribute to Kimball Walker up here on the Jumbo Tron. The Panthers next home game is on October 4th and no word yet on if fans will be allowed to attend, but hopefully there will be some here in these seats cheering on the Panthers. And we talked with him earlier today and you would think maybe your first NBA game ever would make you a little nervous. Well, he says that's eh, not really the case. Stick to the game plan. Quel est ton joueur de basket préféré? Good. Okay. First of all, that's pretty good. <laughs> It's false. You're going trick with the ghost. If it's true, you gotta get that candy corn right. You like candy corn, right? Okay, I'm gonna have to go with a no oh, there, but I'll we'll talk about it later. I'm gonna convince you. First <laughs> okay. one, trick or treat, Stro. This is Kyle Allen's last start this year. All right, I'm going with trick. I think he gets the start at Green Bay. I don't think Cam is gonna be ready for that Packers team. They're super hot right now. Aaron Rodgers at Lambeau and that whole squad, they're kind of rolling. Um, so I think it's gonna be a little little while before we see Cam. And on Wednesday, he wasn't at practice. We know he was rehabbing inside, but still not out there throwing yet. Okay, so just a little montage there of uh, some of the fun stuff that I've been able to do. And people always ask me, they're like, well, what do you do in your free time? And I'm like, truthfully, I'd rather be working because everything I would do in my free time is what I get to do uh, when I'm working. So it could be anything from reporting in the field to being on set anchoring or doing a fun little segment like you saw there at the end with that's Nick Carboni. He's the sports director here. So anyways, I guess we're ready for questions now. <laughs> Yeah, so how this will work, um, if you have a question, you can type it in the chat or you can just type in the chat that you want to ask your question. So let's see if we have any in there. Lenny, take it away. Hi there. Uh this is for Aisha. <laughs> Hi, Aisha. Hi. Um, so I'm a sophomore at uh, NC State right now studying meteorology. And uh, all the clubs were closed to, um, to um, there's a club that uses a green screen. It's called a broadcast meteorology club, of course. But we've never got to use it. I was just wanting to ask you um, how you like manage to like figure out how to point to the right thing and stuff like that. Well, it's funny because, okay, so if you don't know the green screen, it's opposite from what you're doing. So if I'm holding up my right hand, then what I'm seeing or what you're seeing is actually the left hand. Um, oh, okay. It, yeah, it's completely opposite. So <laughs> it takes some practice. But one thing, what really helped me was internships. So I shadowed first and then I got my first internship all at the same station in Norfolk, Virginia. It's actually the NBC affiliate in Norfolk, Virginia. And then from there, I got a part-time job while I was in college. So I was able to really practice on the green screen during my shadowing and internships, but also I went to Mississippi State and we literally have an entire class on nothing but the green screen. Because I think the green screen looks easy, um, yeah. but it takes some practice definitely. And I, I don't feel like it's something you can just jump in front of and, and get the first time. Gotcha. Um, so we had an entire class dedicated strictly to the green screen at Mississippi State. Um, and so it does take practice. And in my opinion, that's, that's one of the, I guess the more challenging things to kind of overcome is just getting comfortable with that green screen and knowing that, you know, it's it's opposite from what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But once you do it enough times, it just it just clicks. So when you're like when you're holding your left hand up in reality to the viewers, does it literally look like your right hand? It, it's your yeah. So it's the opposite. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah. we're supposed to um at my uh, at NC State we're supposed to um uh get into the, like the broadcasting room that we have for the club um and they couldn't have, they couldn't do that this past year, but now they're starting for us to do that. But well, right, thank, thank you, Aisha, nice meeting you. You're welcome, nice meeting you too. All right, the next question is for Ashley. I'm an aspiring sports reporter. This is Shayla. 
Uh, what tips do you have for me when it comes to interviewing coaches and players? Hi, Shayla. Well, I think for me, the most like the mindset I always have is just be myself, right? Like they're just normal people like you and I, and I think they appreciate when you are able to have a real conversation with them. So I think the biggest thing is don't overthink it. I think sometimes we're in press conferences or media scrums and the person asking the question wants to give so much information. And it's like, well, coach knows that, or the player knows that they were involved in the game. They know the stat or they know what happened. And, and sometimes I think people put way too much or they overload their questions when really you just keep it simple and you're going to get a much better answer. So I think don't overthink it, be yourself. And, and once you cover a team enough, you kind of have a relationship or you develop those relationships with coaches and players and, and you know how they're going to respond to certain questions and, and certain things. So you, you kind of learn who they are and what's going to get the best answer for you. The next question, um, also sports related, I think it's Shailene or Shailen, uh, for internships related with sports and radio, did you find them um, mainly from your school or were you able to find another way? Yeah, I was really, really fortunate. So the, I think probably the top thing about going to uh, CSB was the people that taught the classes were in the industry. Like who taught the sports por portion of that was Jim Zoki, and he's done Panthers radio since the team's inception. He also is on uh, FNZ. And so that was a connection I had. Uh, another radio portion was Charlie from Charlie and Debbie. If you listen to country music here in, in the Queen City, they're on uh, one of the stations here. And then uh, Jennifer Moxley, who was a, a reporter in MMJ, um, she taught the reporting part of the class. And so from that, you just start to develop those relationships. And my class was small. There were only nine people in the class. So we really got to develop relationships and there was plenty of time to ask questions or get one-on-one -on -one time with who was teaching that portion of the class. And from that, they already had uh, relationships with the local TV stations or the sports teams or the radio stations. Like, okay, we have uh, this person that's interested in sports, this person that's interested in news, and they would reach out or they would let us know of internships that were available. So my radio internship um, with the morning show with Bo Thompson, that one was one that I applied for. And I went in and interviewed and luckily got that internship. And it, they actually shared the same building as WBTV. And so I'm like, oh, wait, there's a TV station down the hallway. Well, I'm just as interested in TV as I am radio. And luckily they were so happy with what I did as an internship when I was, was there uh, as part of their show that they went to the people down the hallway that they had a relationship with and said, hey, we have a, a young lady here. She's really interested in you know local TV as well. Do you have any type of internship? And for me, I wouldn't have said no to anything. When I interviewed for my internship, I said, I will learn production. I will learn news. I will learn sports. Like, I don't care. I just want to be in the building. And from that, once you're, you have access, once you're in the building, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to speak to people in different departments and that type of thing. So I got really lucky that when I did interview for my internship uh, at the TV station that he's like, okay, I think we have something in sports. Internally, I was like, how did you know? How did you know that's where I want to be? And so I just, I got really fortunate that um, I got to, you know, be in the sports department there, but I would have taken anything. I just because I wanted to be in the building and I wanted to learn so much. And it's, it's really about the relationship. So I was fortunate that the school already had relationships with all the people in Charlotte um, from the people teaching the classes to them reaching out saying, Hey, we, we need interns for this semester. Do you have anybody? Um, but also and there were multiple people that I reached out to. Like, I have no problem going to someone's website, looking at the contact us and firing off an email to everybody. Everybody won't respond. Some people will. Some people will give you great advice. Some people will say, sorry, kid, we've got nothing for you, but somebody, somebody will get back to you. So I think don't be afraid to send the email, even if you've never met the person, but hopefully wherever you study, they have some type of connection with people that can help get you in the door. This next question is for Aisha. What kind of uh, creative control do you have in your forecasts? Are you allowed to put things that you want to do or do you have to follow a certain guideline? Do you have to follow a certain design scheme to keep it looking consistent? 
So that's a good question. Um, I will say here, so our parent company is Tegna. And so we do have, all of our stations have a particular look to our weather graphics. However, there are things or graphics that, you know, we can make ourselves that will help us to better tell the weather story that in general, it has the same theme, but we can kind of create and tweak the graphics as we see fit. For instance, um, I have a hair forecast, <laughs> a, a frizz forecast is what I call it. And, you know, for me as a woman, I need to know the dew points because that tells me how high the humidity is. And that tells me if I've got to keep curling my hair every five minutes, or if the dew points are in the forties, low humidity, then I'm good to go. I can curl it once and I'm good for three hours. Um, so you do have creative uh, control over, say, your graphics that you are creating that will help you to tell a better weather story. But in general, the parent company, if you will, will have an overall look. Um, and that's not just with our parent company, Tegna, but you may see other companies, um, whether their stations owned by, say, ABC or NBC, they all, the stations all have a general look, but you can still add in your own little twist on things. I hope that answered your question. All right, this is um, uh, from Shayla. How long did it take you both to get to where you were, are? Um, and what types of obstacles did you face? You wanna go first, Aisha? You can go since I just finished. Yeah. Okay, well, for, <laughs> for me, I think once I just made my mind up that this was it, this is what I was gonna do, I'm dipping into the life savings to go back to school. We're going to make it happen. All right. So I, um, I was pretty determined. There wasn't much you could tell me about that. This wasn't going to work out somehow, but it certainly was not easy. I mean, at one point my life, I think just consisted of naps. Like when can I get sleep? When can I get a 10 minute nap in? Because I was already working a full-time job. So I was, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I was teaching high school, but I wanted to really be in this industry but I couldn't quit my day job. So I was, you know, work, being, I was at the high school at 6.45 in the morning, getting out of the parking lot as quick as I could by 2.30, driving to Uptown Charlotte, some days sprinting into the building to run prompter for the four o'clock show. And then I would edit the eight o'clock show, but that was all news. My goal was sports. So then when I finished editing the eight o'clock show, I wanted to spend time with the sports director and learn from him. He had been in the business for nearly 30 years at that point. So a lot of nights I would stay at least until the 11 or through the 1130, go home, get a few hours of sleep, go back and, and do it all over again the next day. So I think people a lot of times see where someone is currently and don't realize it was such a grind to get there. Um, people only look at where people are at. They only see the success and don't necessarily understand. It rarely ever is just like, boom, you're there. It, so, so that was how it started for me. It was first going back to school and being brave enough to do that. Then it was, okay, I've got the part-time job, but I still got to pay my bills. So I got to work the full-time job. And then it was just saying, all right, I'm going all in. And I quit the full-time job and did the radio job and the and the part-time TV and then just worked and worked and worked. And a lot of times in, in TV, they'll tell you, okay, you have to go to mark a small market and work your way up. But I'd already been in Charlotte, you know, and kind of started my life there. And I was like, man, I got to make this work. I don't want to leave Charlotte. Like I got to figure it out. And I, I got kind of lucky. And I also pretty much lived at the TV station for the first year I was there. And um, when the full-time position opened up, they didn't have anybody because I didn't think that was going to happen. And I kind of just got thrown into the fire. I'm not going to show you my first show. As Aisha was mentioning earlier, if we go back to like our first reel or our first show, I had no idea really what I was doing, but they trusted me enough to you know, let me go out there and, and give it a go. And um, while they were auditioning people and interviewing people, they didn't have anybody. So I just got to keep getting reps and keep filling in. And after like a month and a half, two months of that, they were like, you know what, you've improved enough. We believe in you. We're going to keep you. But there were moments when I was in the sports office crying, knowing there was an interview candidate down the hallway. And I'm like, oh gosh, I need this job. I want this job. I don't want to leave Charlotte. So it was definitely a roller coaster and a, a wave of emotions, but I look back now and I wouldn't change any of that. I actually just had a conversation with somebody and I feel like the beginnings are so pure and so raw because you just, you want it so bad and you're grinding so hard and you're 
trying to figure out a way to get there. So all of that really shaped me. And I don't take anything for granted because I really went through the trenches to get to where I am. And, and like I said before, like even my first job, like I have such an appreciation for what the people behind the scenes do because I worked there in the beginning and I see like they're putting out the fires while we're on air. They're making it happen. So uh, yeah, it was, it's a lot and it wasn't easy, but if you just keep persisting and believing in yourself and working at your craft, I mean, I'm talking, I had scripts at home and I was reading in the mirror back to myself, or I would record myself on my computer and play it back just to try and get better. So a lot of hard work, but I, I wouldn't change any of it. And I can go on for hours about this, but I'm going to stop and let Aisha go. <laughs> so I would say, gosh, I had so many challenges. Um, you know, first, when I, I got my bachelor's degree in, from Norfolk State University in communications and broadcasting, and I did that because I was thinking I need to put two and two together. So I need to get a communications degree. I need to get a meteorology degree and like marry those two together um, because I knew I wanted to go into TV. Um, when I decided to become a meteorologist, I was seven years old. So I was little, I just knew I loved hurricanes. I loved thunderstorms and I wanted to be on the television telling people how to get ready for storms and hurricanes. Um, so when I you know, was in college, I shadowed, I interned and then ended up getting a part-time job at the same place. And literally I worked from 4 a.m. So I would get there at about 3.30 for the 4.30 show. And I worked until seven o'clock when the show was done. And then I drove to college and I was at school for my eight o'clock class. And my classes went until I think about two. So I was literally, it felt like up for hours. I was so tired most of the time, but it was what I really needed to do to help get me at least going in the direction that I really wanted to go in. Um, I think the other challenge for me, you know, as a black woman, I didn't see me growing up on TV doing what it was that I wanted to do. So that made me question if it was even possible. Could I, could I do this? Because I don't see anyone who looks like me doing this thing that I want to do. The other thing was the math classes. So I was super good at, at science. Earth science, loved it, it was my thing. But math, I was not good at at all. I should have known Ashley, like back in the day, <laughs> she could have helped me out. I struggled in math. And so when I saw the classes that I had to take, I was like, there is no way I'm gonna make it through this. And when I went to Mississippi State, I kid you not, I had a tutor and she was with me, I mean, for, every single class, every single math class that I had to take, she was with me and I had her on speed dial and she would meet me after classes early in the morning. But that was the only way that I was getting through those math classes was my tutor. Because again, I wasn't a great math student, but I loved science. So I would say, don't let what you're not good at stop you from pursuing what it is that you truly want to do and also don't let you not seeing yourself stop you from pursuing what it is that you really want to do when i got my first um, job uh, this sounds a lot like ashley's story um i wanted to just like get my first job job you know like my real job and so i actually started off um in Richmond, Virginia at the NBC affiliate in Richmond, Virginia. And I was hired to do production. So I ran the teleprompter, just like Ashley, I ran the teleprompter. I handed out scripts to the anchors for the shows. And out of nowhere, randomly, because I was practicing on the green screen, working with the meteorologist, I would stay after on weekends and practice on the green screen. And the news director at the time, she said, you know, do you wanna fill in on traffic? because you're kind of good at the green screen. And I was thinking, filling in on traffic, like on actual TV, there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> like, there's no way. But I did, and she gave me the opportunity to fill in on traffic. I did that, and, and I feel like that was what really like projected me you know, on this course, because I started filling in on traffic. And then it was like, okay, I got this down. I got the green screen down. And then I got my first weather job. Um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And that came from me doing so well, filling in on traffic. I knew the weather. So, you know, I knew the green screen. I knew I could kind of put those two together. So I got my first job in Wilmington, North Carolina. 
And I want to mention this. I don't know how many of you have spouses and all of that fun stuff, but I got married in August and I got my first weather on air job in September. So my husband did not want to go to Wilmington. And so I said, okay. So he stayed in Virginia. I went to Wilmington. We were four hours apart and we drove back and forth for two years. So sometimes you really have to do what it is you have to do in order to make the dream work. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't go back and change anything because where I am now, I look back on that. I'm like, I'm like, okay, I had to make these sacrifices and it's finally paying off and I'm not, you know, having to sleep two hours just to, you know, head to class or whatever. I feel like those sacrifices in the beginning, they really pay off, but you have to stick with it. If it's something you really want, don't let the obstacles and the early morning hours, whatever the hours look like, don't let it stop you from pursuing that goal and that dream that you have. Sorry, that's kind of long, but. <laughs> the next question um, is for Ashley. I'm interested in interning in radio. What was it like uh, working for KISS 95.1? Well, I don't know if you're a morning person. I am not. So that was the struggle for me uh, because they go on the air. I'm assuming it's still at like six o'clock. So I needed to be there at like five or 5.30 in the morning. Uh, but I also was working a job of the evening, so made it a little hard to balance out. Um, but I, Manny, Roy, and Loren, we still have a great relationship. Um, if they need someone to talk about sports, Uptown Ash, that's what they used to call me <laughs> on the show. I'll, I'll hop on there and we still do segments together today. Um, but I loved it. You know, they did their show and I was in the booth kind of, um, taking phone calls and screening viewers that were calling in for the show and letting them know who we had on line one or who we had on line two. I was updating the website and then when they would all take vacation. Um, I got to fill in and I would kind of run the show. I think there's a lot of things people don't know about radio though. Um, like if you're listening to kiss 95, one in the afternoon on your lunch break or whatever, those songs, like a DJ is not actually choosing those songs. It's pre-programmed uh, by somebody I don't know the exact title, but someone has a job and their job is to program the music that's going to go play throughout the week. So I, my first time filling in, I'm like, okay, I'm going to DJ. I'm going to pick the songs like, nope, just make sure everything runs okay and talk in the breaks. So, so it's a little bit different. I think that I learned a lot working there and what it's really like in radio, but as far as interning or, or working for uh, Kiss 95.1, they were great people. I learned so much about radio, a lot of really cool experiences Aside from it being early in the morning, it was a really fun job. Um, a lot of cool guests would come in when they were doing concerts. Um, I think probably the highlight, if you want to talk about that kind of stuff, Ed Sheeran was here doing a concert and we all got to go over to Spectrum Center to watch. And before the show, he came out with his guitar and sat down and there was like maybe 10 of us and played like a little acoustic set for us. And I was like, well, that was, that was really nice. That's a cool part to this job, but those are few and far between, but um, yeah, just great. A lot of fun. If you listen to their show regularly, you know, they just are there to have a good time. <laughs> Always a good time. Now they're sharing a lot of stuff digitally. Um, so you get to see what they're actually doing when they're in the studio. We didn't do that so much when I was there, but it's definitely something that they've, they've started doing now. So I think it's great. It's a totally dip, different atmosphere. Radio and TV, I think are very different, especially top 40 morning show. You're just there to have fun. You do kind of crazy segments sometimes like I'm like mm, I'm too private for this I am not talking about that like I think tinder was a big thing when I started working there I was the only single one so Manny was like you have to do tinder Tuesdays and I was like I am not doing tinder Tuesdays so we made an account and Manny did tinder for me so anyone who matched with me on tinder while I was at the radio station that was all Manny but it was just fun segments like that is my point so totally different I'm a little more buttoned up so I I like where I'm at now but I, I mean, I don't have anything bad to say. It was a really fun year of my life. All right, for the next question, um, this is for Ashley. I'm a current student at CSB um, and I'm an aspiring sports reporter. Would you recommend looking for a first job as a reporter in a smaller market or look in a large market like Charlotte? I know that you started in Charlotte, but just wanted to know if you had to do it again, would you look um, elsewhere? So I'm the wrong person to ask because the, I think the answer most people would say is, you know, do the small market, you know, get your reps, work, work your way up and that kind of thing. And I do think there is, um, 
definitely a lot of positives to going to the small market because you really get to you get all those reps and you really get to learn who you are as a broadcaster and then you kind of are kind of groomed to go to the next market and the next market for me i wouldn't change anything just because i'm i'm really grateful that i i went through a lot of growing pains in charlotte and a lot of different roles in tv but i had a really great mentor and i mean everything from us sitting in a live truck and him bringing scripts to being like, okay, you're coming on air to do a high school football highlight on Friday. We've got to practice. Like, let's go through this. And I, and me laughing at him being like, you literally brought paper scripts to the, to the live truck for us to practice for what we're going to do. But he cared that much about me working hard and, and getting reps and, and learning and that kind of thing. So I think there's, there's beauty in both. I think it's hard to break in to a top 25 market as your first job. I definitely don't think it's, uh, impossible because I was lucky enough to knock that door down. But that also came from me working as an editor, me working in part-time sports, me going in on my off time and having a relationship with the director on the weekends. Hey, if I come in Saturday after the six o'clock show, will you let me practice the sports cast three or four times? Like it wasn't like I was just sitting there one day and got to go on air. It was me showing up every time I was in the field with a, a reporter, can I package that? Could I shoot a stand up? Can you teach me how to edit? So I worked really, 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 really hard to get that opportunity to go on the air here. And it was a lot of timing that worked out. Like if, if Leah wouldn't have left when she did, who knows where I would be right now. But um, so I, I can't, you know, my heart says, you know, aim for the stars, go with whatever you want, but you also have to take the opportunity that comes your way. And I was to that point, like, I like I talked about crying in the sports office and I was like, all right, if this doesn't work out, I got to go. I don't know. I can't do two part time jobs forever. So and just hoping that one day I get picked. I got I, I'm very, very, very fortunate for how my everything played out for me. So I think it's opportunity. What doors open for you and where are you willing to go to get your first start? You know, go somewhere for two years and work in that small market and do everything you can to be better and learn and and really work on your craft. Um, but if you get an opportunity somewhere in Charlotte with a sports team or to do some part-time stuff or even full-time, take it and see see what happens. All right, for Aisha and Ashley, is it common to be a journalist in a little of everything or is it best to just focus on one area? So I think, and when you say a journalist and, and a little bit of everything. So for me, I knew specifically what I wanted to do, which was weather. Um, and so that's what I really focused on. But as a meteorologist, obviously there are other um, parts. So there are digital, you know, you've got to write web stories, et cetera, et cetera. There's social media that comes with that. Um, I think if if you aren't quite sure what it is that you want to do, exploring and, you know, kind of looking at those other fields, whether it's meteorology or sports, or maybe it's reporting or anchoring, um, looking at those other fields to get a better idea or a sense of what it is that you may want to do. But I think definitely having like a concentration or a focus is better than, you know, just kind of trying a little bit of everything if you know what it is that you want to do. Yeah, I think, I tried to be really open-minded when I was studying just because I didn't know where the opportunity was going to come. And I think so many things kind of overlap, especially like in 2021, it's like, okay, are you doing a podcast? Are you broadcasting? Are you editing? Like, there's just so many things that I feel like everybody's doing and, and how to stay on top of all that. I don't know. For me, like I knew sports was where I wanted to be. I played sports growing up. I coached, like my mom coached. It was just it's in my DNA and it's what I feel comfortable talking about. And it's what brings me joy. It's what makes me happy. So I think for me, my focus was always sports. Um, but with that, I think like I'm open to, I think sports and entertainment kind of crossover, right? So if there's a fun story to tie in that way, maybe I would, maybe I would do that. Um, but I think, I think it's kind of, you kind of learn what you like and you take the opportunity. If you're unsure, like when you're in school, you can go hang out with the meteorologist. You can hang out with the weather person, the news person behind the scenes. And you kind of learn what you think you might enjoy, but with anything in life, you can change it. Like what your dream is today might not be where you want to be in, in 10 years. You know, I started out as a high school teacher and quickly did a 180 there. So <laughs> I will say too, you know, 
as a meteorologist, I also do um, a lot of community stories because I think it's, it's important to also think about your passion kind of outside of that one realm. So I know that I, I love weather, but I also love inspiring and encouraging young people. And so I try to find those stories, whether it's, you know, the STEM camp that's going on in Charlotte. And so I would, you know, tell those stories, do that package and have that air and, you know, air on, on television. So I think it also depends on what your passions are and kind of how they align with what you're, you're doing or hoping to do. I agree because I, I think like for me, it's not just about touchdowns and slam dunks, right? Like I was a part of the community as a teacher and I felt like I was really helping kids get to the next chapter of their life. And I still wanted to be able to have a impact in the community. So there's so many sports stories, right? That you can also tell whether it's, you know, a player in their foundation giving back or a ball camp that kids can sign up for for free or giving back to, you know, different types of communities. So I think like Aisha said, it's more than just here's the forecast and more than just here are your highlights. It's also making an impact in the community that, you know, looks to your station and, and watches you every day for those normal things that you do, but also giving back to them. Next questions for Aisha. When you have a master's in meteorology, did you have to do four years worth of coursework or just add two years to your bachelor's? So I have two bachelor degrees um, and I actually had to do four years and four years. So I was in school for eight years total. Um, and the reason I did that, looking back, would I do that? No, um, because all I needed was my meteorology degree. But in my in my thought process, you know, when I was 18 was, okay, I need a, to learn the TV side and I need to learn the weather side and I'll kind of mesh those together. That was my thought process. You don't need to do that, I would say in 2021, because so many meteorolo meteorology schools, they actually have um, like communication minors or um, like Lenny had mentioned, you know, they have a uh, green screen, a broadcasting club. So you can learn these things without getting a second degree and it'll save you money. So you don't have to pay student loans for the rest of your life. So there's that. That's, that's true. Uh, wait, <laughs> another thing I wanted to add is that, so like when I think of a master's degree, I think of it as like six years. So would you say, is it technically two, a double, a double bat, like double major? So like two majors. So, or is it technically a bachelor's and a master's for like your as like your certifications? If you did six years, then yeah, it would be the bachelor's and the master's. Okay, I got you. Is that what you're asking? I was just asking like you personally, like is it considered like two bachelor's degrees, you know, because you did four years of communications, four years of meteorology? Oh, for me personally, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, just two separate bachelor's degrees, one in um, math communications and then one in meteorology. Okay, gotcha. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Again, I wouldn't do that looking back, <laughs> but it's okay. Gotcha. I'm currently minoring in geology. Would that help at all if it for broadcast for broadcast meteorology at all? I would try to get some communications journalism classes under your belt. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I certainly would. You're welcome. All right. Our last question. Um, if you have any more, put in the chat. We still have a few minutes left. For Ashley, was uh, there certain courses for sports broadcasting you had to take, as well as any courses you think would be beneficial to take in school? So I feel like I'm not the prime candidate to answer this question, just because, like, truthfully, my my bachelor's is all math. Like I like I was saying earlier, like I went all the way through Calc four. I did foundations of math, where you're looking at stuff with like upside down A's and backwards E's. Nothing to do with sports, right? I played intramurals in college, so if that counts for anything, maybe that helped out. But so as far as the bachelor's degree. I, you know, I think we had some classes listed earlier that you can kind of look at. You definitely want to, you know, do communications. You want to, if there's a specific thing to sports broadcasting and you know that's what you want to do, definitely take some of those classes. Um, I was lucky at, you know, CSB. I went to um, the Charlotte campus here and we had, like I mentioned, J Jim Zoki, who was voice of the Panthers. He came in. He also did stuff on FNZ and some of the morning shows in town. Um, that taught our sports portion. And for that, he literally, it, again, I'm a visual learner. I'm a hands-on learner. So one of our assignments in class 
Zoki just put up, all right, we're going to do play by play. And we're all like, what? Right now in front of the whole class and just played the clip of, of a Panthers game. And we had to call it as it was happening. There was no studying. There was no research. It was just like, you're the broadcaster. And when you're in the booth, you've got to be telling the audience at home what's going on. And so for me, that's how I learned. And that's what you know, kind of taught me some skills that I need when I am calling highlights on TV or when I'm watching a play, what am I seeing? What am I looking at? What's he looking at as a, as a broadcaster? And, you know, if you're listening to a, a game on the radio, those are your eyes and ears, right? And so they have to be so descriptive and they have to do a good job of relaying the message to those people at home. So that was really beneficial to me and being put on the spot like that definitely made me feel the heat, the pressure a little bit, but, um, I can't speak to how it is now if you end up going there and, and you do their program. But for us, it was there were nine people in the class and it was kind of divided up into three sections. And we focused one on radio, one on TV and one on social media uh, and that and digital stuff. So it was just such a combination of everything. And we had different projects and different all three of those groups, everything from learning how to build your own website to for me, like my focus again was sports. But um, I can't speak to a direct class that you should take as far as if you're going to a, a university, but I think it's probably best just to sit down and, and talk with people there uh, at your school and see what they can offer. And I also, like when I was looking to go back, I, I looked at universities around, like I talked to Elon, I went there and took a tour to see what they had to offer. There were different places called UNC Charlotte. I just want to check every possible program that was out there. And so I think a good thing to do is wherever you're at or where you're looking to study, see where people are that have went through that program and reach out to them and, you know, what, what benefited them. Cause I'm not sure where you are looking to study or where you're in school, but I think it's really important to research who's already done it and what benefited them uh, at that specific program. But for me, I was already coaching. I played sports. So I had the knowledge. It was just about learning how to, put it out there on TV. I, I would add in, Ashley, I think follow sports, watch sports, consume yeah. sports, right? Definitely. Local sports broadcasters like yourself, not just national ones, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's, and then also be very comfortable in speaking, talk in front of your mirror, right? Yeah. Do what Ashley did, watch the football game, turn down the sound, call it. Um, yeah. because that's one gift sports casters have and weather casters is they're very glib and they can talk uh, without scripts in front of them. And you have to get comfortable with that. I used to say, talk on while you're driving to work, you know, get yeah. used to hearing your voice and um, speaking. And I think that's just something you could do. Definitely. And now with all the technology, you literally can do a voice memo and play it back and hear yourself. And you, like for me, when I first started and I'm sure like in real life, I'm a Southern girl, it is what it is, but I try to turn that off for TV. But when I first started, I would listen to certain words and I'm like, I will never put that in a script. Oh my goodness, is that how I say that in real life? So you learn a lot about yourself when you when you do that. And, and some you learn some synonyms for some words so you don't use the ones that come out a little funky. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad we're not showing like first clips and oh, I had a Southern draw that was like, it was strong, you know, so I had to work to bring that off, to bring that down. So that's a great point. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap up there. We're right about at time. You guys had great questions. You were great participants. I'm going to remind you that tomorrow is MMJ reporters and anchors in the morning and then producing an assignment desk in the afternoon and then back with sales and revenue and marketing to wrap us up on Friday. So a huge thank you to Aisha and Ashley. You guys were terrific. Thank you so much. You guys were great participants with good questions. Um, we hope this was helpful. And like we said, we'll be posting all the sessions online eventually. And we'll, I think we figured out how to email everybody who registered and we'll give you that uh, link when we're ready for that. So thank you everyone.